there are going to be uh, five of us speaking, 15 minutes each, and uh, on, on different topics. And, and my topic is, uh, uh, it will not be surprising to those of you who know me, sort of a, uh, a uh, sort of a really quick recap associated with, look, this is really exciting and important, and I'm hoping that you'll do something with the material as you go ahead. So let me, there are only six pages on this or seven, something like that. So let me begin on page one of this rent. Okay. So recall that uh, what we find in the world today are two important innovation paradigms. All of you in business school have really focused on the Schumpeterian one, the one about uh, sort of money and uh, people innovating in order to sell something. And in a way, what also happens in business school is that there's a focus on, well, how can I be an entrepreneur? How can I do this out of that and be sort of commercially active? And I fully understand that. I mean, you know, when I uh, was starting out and was your age, your relative ages, uh, you know, I needed to support my family and I needed to do stuff that was tied to uh, earning a living. And so still what I want you to know is that uh, there is this other paradigm. And I, I do believe that I'm the only one in the Sloan School teaching about this at this point yet. So um, you're already really ahead of the game that you know about it. And as you remember, it's sort of a free innovation paradigm. It's citizens and others doing it because they have a need. So they're self-rewarded, nobody has to pay them. And then they collaborate and build and then you have peer-to-peer -peer free diffusion. Now, from the commercial perspective, you can then say, wow, this is a big advantage. You know, because people will make designs for me as an entrepreneur for free, fabulous, and uh, my costs go down. But from the point of social welfare and so on, what you have to understand is that there's more to it. And this is the social welfare and sort of the personal freedoms that you gain is what I want to talk about in the next three or four slides. So a central lesson of the free innovation paradigm is that you have personal responsibility and personal empowerment to match. What we learned is that if you need an innovation, producers are often, not just not necessarily, but they are often not going to be able to come up with what you want and still make money within their model. If you're somebody who has a rare disease, you know, it's going to be unlikely that firms come to your rescue. If you have some sort of exotic leading edge ideas about sport or whatever it means to do it something novel for yourself, again, you're going to find that producers are going to wait around for you to do it. So the nice thing then, given that you see that the commercial sort of Schumpeterian paradigm has lots of holes because lots of things don't make money and yet people need them. The nice thing is of the free innovation paradigm, what we have learned is that you're empowered. If you need an innovation, you increasingly can develop it for yourself. And what we have done in this course is walked you through a number of sort of examples of that and also walked you through the various kinds of uh, tools that you could use and problems that you would encounter like diffusion. So I thank everybody who's been involved in, in, in teaching about this. Now what I want to remind you about is a, something I talked to you about in the second or third uh, lecture just as an illustration of this kind of problem and the way things work nowadays. So I'll give you three slides on this and then I'll just go back to saying, you know what? 
the freedom is there, the empowerment is there, it's getting stronger and stronger, and uh, be aware, be aware that you're empowered, because you're not empowered just because the facilities are out there. You're only empowered when the facilities are out there and you're aware of what you can do. Okay, so recall Ivan Owen, do you remember that? Some of you mm -hmm. may. And you remember that they created uh, Hands for Kids, that thing, that the red thing that that kid is holding. And the story I find compelling because it really is, as this course says, about innovation in the internet age. It's about people finding each other. So you may remember in brief outline that there was this guy, Ivan Owen, who was making these puppet hands. And then somebody saw what he posted on the web, somebody, that guy in the yellow shirt named Richard Van Oss. And he had cut half his hand off and he in South Africa, how amazing, had contacted Ivan in Seattle and said, hey, Ivan, do you think you can use this thing to make a hand for me? And Ivan said, sure. And again, it wasn't that anybody was gonna make any money off this, which is really interesting. Sure, I can try to do that. And so then Ivan got uh, frequent flyer miles from friends and flew to, uh, cause he didn't have a lot of money and, and, and flew to uh, South Africa where Richard, because he was a cabinet maker, had a machine shop and they began to build his hand. You remember that? And then uh, the lady down the street, you see in the middle there on the left, uh, the lady down the street had a kid who, whose hand at birth had been absent. And uh, Richard Van Oss didn't know about that. Ivan didn't know about it. But it turned out that there were many kids with this problem. It's a birth defect. It's a problem with respect to how you grow and mature in the womb. And so, you know, this lady, mothers are wonderful. Fathers are wonderful too, but mothers are wonderful, you know, always looking around for chances for their kid. I said, hey, can you help Liam? And so they said, sure. And once again, you know, I mean, it's so empowering and so different to be able to have your own resources and just say, sure, as opposed to, hmm, how can I make a business out of this? It's amazing. And so what you saw there was they were building this thing and they built the hand. And in the end, bottom right, you see Liam grabbing a bottle for the first time and uh, happiness prevails. Now, today, this thing is on the web on a uh, website that uh, the uh, NSF, is, is it NSF? It's underneath my little screen thing here. Yeah, NIH. Uh, 3D printable prosthetics are changing the face of, of, of medicine. Remember, this was a hack. <laughs> As engineers and physicians are able to develop prosthetics that are fully customized to the wearer. And then printed by passionate volunteers using 3D printing. Right? Now, that's about the citizen innovation paradigm. That's about free innovation. And then you can see those happy kids there. Uh, they used to be teased in class, but now they have the coolest hands in class. And so uh, they're very happy to show them off and, and to use them. So that is an example of what's happening now. Look what happened, how magic it is. People from around the world could find each other. People from around the world had equipment, namely 3D printers that they could use on this project. They could share the designs because of the internet. And people felt like helping kids locally. And so now there's hundreds of people doing that. Now, here's the contrast. Here's Tasca, New Zealand. One hand costs $35,000. It's a mile up the hand. Uh, expensive, they're sort of noting, but the majority of the devices are purchased through an insurance scheme at no cost to amputees. Hmm. Well, still $35,000 is quite a lot. And it really won't work for children because children need newly sized hands 
as often as they need newly sized shoes. And so you have to make them a new hand every six months. Clearly $35,000 every six months is not gonna fly. And by the way, if you happen to dip that hand in water, the whole thing's fried, it's an electronic hand. And so, uh, you know, uh, there goes another $35,000. So that is the best at the moment that the producer innovation paradigm can do. That's something that makes money because of uh, insurance schemes and so on and so forth and can be done. And the people who are doing it are well motivated. I'm certainly not saying they're not. Mm -hmm. But now look at the contrast here. $35 in materials. So the commercial hand costs a thousand times more. And this is all an affordance that comes out of people's free time. And so it increases social welfare. Now, you can do it in medicine, you can do it in sports, as we've talked about, but this is out there and it is increasingly able to allow you to have different paths for innovation. And so, as I say, if you need an innovation, producers are not necessarily going to develop it for you or not going to be able to develop in a form that really fits as an example of that hand I just showed you. I mean, it simply does not fit the child uh, uh, without a hand market. And so the lesson of this course, the core lesson from my perspective at least is that today you increasingly can develop what you need for yourself, either individually, or as we saw in this particular example, collaboratively. So with respect to you as students, uh, I, I really hope you keep this in mind. You know, It's a new option that is not fully appreciated yet. So that was my rant for the day. You could have predicted that it was gonna happen, right? Uh, let me stop sharing. Um, and uh, Erdine, would you like to come next? I, I would, uh, Eric, but maybe before I go next, we could ask the students if they would have uh, questions for you. Yes, <coughs> you're yes, absolutely inspiring. Anybody? Aditi? Yes, Aditi. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, uh, my question is that can a producer can um, I think we discussed it, but like still just to get some clarity, you know, can a producer look at all the um, you know the open the open source designs, for example, or open source codes, and just tweak it a little bit based on all the hours and hours of work done by people all around the world, and then patent it and um, you know commercialize it, kind of like in, in a way it's cheating also, you know. Well, they, they, they can't patent what the users did because the users put it out publicly, right? And, and everybody- But make it. some changes to it. Yeah, they can improve it, okay. yeah. And then, and then can they patent it? Like after making some improvements? Like they can patent their changes. improvements, yes. They can patent their improvements. Now, notice, I think what you're thinking about is, is this fair, is that right? Yeah, for somebody to commercialize because you know, people sometimes just step on other people and use their work and sell it, right? We've, I've seen that happen. Yeah, but you know what? The reason that people are doing this, like the example of the, uh, uh, the hand that I just showed you, or mountain bikes and all the rest, when we survey them, they're doing it because they are self-rewarded, right? They're doing it for their own purposes. Now, if they want to do it for commercial purposes, they have perfect freedom to do that. They can, even though they're a household sector innovator, patent or do whatever they want to do and start a, you know, a hand company. You know, and in fact, Richard Van Aas did start a hand company. He was that guy that initially uh, was the one who called Ivan Owen, do you remember? He did, but then it turned out, and there's a famous remark, it's hard to compete with free. It turned out that he couldn't, make a commercial market for this because the free uh, designs and the free enable network were so powerful. So I really think what you have to remember is that if you want to innovate and keep it for yourself, 
you can do it. However, if you give out what you've done freely, from my perspective, you're doing it because you're rewarded already and you've made a choice. In that case, you know, you, you really can't expect uh, other people to say, oh, okay, uh, you know, you didn't want to profit from this, but no, you can. That's, that's my view of the matter. Can I add one more thing uh, with respect to that? We have a very odd system of intellectual property and so on. It's so partial in its coverage that people within businesses are also always getting copied. I mean, copying is the norm, whether it's recipes or anything else, copying without payment. In music, it's often kind of copying without payment. So I think the way we're going is that IP will end up free in any case. So that's my rant number 17B. Thanks for your comment though. All right, Erdine, we better get on to you. Sounds great. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Mm. It's um, hard to believe that this is uh, the end of the course almost. And uh, I, I should tell you all that this is the first time that uh, I'm teaching at my alma mater, MIT Sloan. And, you know, and I'm grateful to you, Eric, for the opportunity. And I'm grateful to you all for the, for the attention. I have learned uh, so much and um, I'm very excited to build on the learnings. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited uh, for all of you taking this knowledge into, into your future. And so the way I thought I'd contribute to our session today is by offering some philosophical remarks on user innovation and education for the road, so to speak. And I'm doing it um, with the following understanding, you studied uh, the free innovation paradigm this uh, semester, uh, and you have also done it under very unusual educational circumstances, somewhat unprecedented. And many of you are also graduating. So, uh, for, right. right? So for, for many of you, for many of you, this is going to be really the end of your formal education. Many of you are graduate students, likely you will not be coming back to university anytime soon for long ranging um, graduate degrees. And so what does this mean for you? Does your education stop? How do you continue your education? How do you think about it? And that's what I wanna discuss with you today. And as, as I said, shared with you in the beginning, you know, I, I was born in a country that uh, no longer exists, uh, the, the Soviet yeah. Union. And I'm sharing this with you because a lot of um, that experience informs my thinking about education and innovation today. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, growing up in the Soviet Union, you know, uh, I remember people being proud of being citizens of that country. And in particular, people were very proud of the fact that they were citizens of the world's largest country. We had many songs and poems celebrating the fact, hey, you know, we live in the largest country in the world. And all of a sudden, in 1991, uh, my country becomes sad, Kyrgyzstan, this uh, tiny red country, <laughs> right? Uh, you think about this, this, the scale of transformation. And uh, this is uh, a postcard of uh, my hometown, Frunze. It's wow. now called Bishkek. And I remember the day when um, you know, we were in school, I was in sixth grade, and uh, our teacher walked in uh, into the classroom in the morning and she said, hey, kids, our city is no longer called Frunze. It is now called Bishkek. And wow. you all live in a different country. <laughs> Imagine somebody uh, joined yeah. our school today and said, hey, uh, this is no longer Boston, right? Something yeah. like that. And this was just a complete uh, upending of identity. In fact, I, I wrote my undergraduate uh, dissertation on how ethics and morality can transform very quickly in a society, how notions that we used to respect and uh, idolize suddenly become derogatory. And in particular, my dissertation focused on the word patriot. Patriot used to be quite a laudable um, adjective in, in the Soviet Union, but after its collapse, it became a derogatory word. To call someone a patriot was to call someone essentially a, a loser. And I asked myself, well, how can this happen? But this um, 
shift from being a citizen of the largest country in the world to being a citizen of, the, of one of the smallest countries where I had to get a visa literally to go next door to, to a country that wasn't even a separate country, but just a region next door. I had to get a visa and suddenly they had a different currency. Made me think about the following issues. Uh, it made me think about what does it mean to be in the center and the periphery? Um, and what are the feelings produced by that? And, you know, um, I sense that there are a lot of people in the world who experience this tension. They do not feel they're at the center of the world. They feel they're at the periphery. They're at the periphery of innovation. They're at the periphery of progress. And I think a lot of despair that is produced in the world and that creates a lot of our problems, conflicts, stems from that tension. What does it mean to be included or excluded? I was included into the largest community in the world, and now I was excluded from that big community. I was experiencing exclusion um, and I'll be belonging and alienation. Um, you know, where do you belong and where do you not belong? Um, and I began sensing that those are important um, tensions for people in the world. And I, I'm sure all of you in one way or another have experienced those, those tensions. And many of our educational and professional aspirations are driven by those tensions and really come, come, come down to it. And, and what was also important uh, during the time is that, you know, um, a lot of people became very poor. Uh, my, you know, my dad um, uh, worked at a university during the time and uh, staff members of the university didn't get paid for 12 months. Uh, many people who worked in factories, the factories didn't have cash to pay salaries. And so what factories would do, they would actually give its product to, to its uh, workers and the workers would have to sell the product to earn the cash. And so you could see if you, if you drive along, along a highway, you could see people standing on the side of the highway selling car windows, selling refrigerators, selling sugar, selling liquor. Those were the products produced by their factories and then that's how they made a living. And compounding that, we had tremendous political instability. In my country alone, we experienced uh, in a 10 year span, two political revolutions. And, and, and this is a picture of uh, people in my hometown, the very hometown that I showed you early on, storming the White House. Uh, and yeah, I was, I was a kid at the time. And I began thinking about this question, well, how do we live in uncertainty? How do you, how do you survive in an uncertain world? And how do you not just survive, but how do, you, how do you thrive? And really, this is the question we are asking ourselves today. We're experiencing a different kind of uncertainty, but uncertainty nonetheless, all of us. So how do we live in it? And I started, my, I started observing. And what I started noticing is that, you know, yeah, a lot of people suffered. And that's true. And that was very painful. And it is true today. But some people thrived. And I asked myself the question, well, how and why? What makes them thrive, whereas everyone else is having a difficult time? And you know, some people thrived because they were corrupt. Um, you know about perhaps uh, the privatization um, programs in the former Soviet Union where many people privatized state-owned enterprises in a very corrupt way, became very rich. But some people, so that, that's not what I was interested in. Um, I, but some people thrived in a very honest way by doing interesting, honest work. And I said, what's behind that? And as I observed it, I started noticing that people thrived because they had education, and in particular, education that had tangible economic benefit on society. And they also amplified it with an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, in particular, I was, I was astounded by how English teachers did well during that time. And that's because our country was opening up. Suddenly, you could travel abroad. Before that, we couldn't travel abroad. We weren't allowed. Now you could. Now you could work with foreign organizations. And so people wanted to learn foreign languages, English in particular. And so uh, some people developed nice enterprises teaching English. I was like, oh, that's, that's very interesting. And then over time, I began asking myself the question, well, if education and entrepreneurial mindset, and this is really what we're learning in this course, right? Um, what Eric described uh, in his session today is an application of an entrepreneurial mindset, and that's what it created. And so I said, how do you teach that? Because this is so important. It needs to be shared. It needs to be taught. How do you do that? And I, at first, I didn't know if it was possible. And, and then I wasn't sure how to do that. 
and this really comes down to the question of, well, what is education? Right? This, is, this is really the, the, the question that needs to be answered. And I want you to think for a moment what your definition of education is. And the reason this is important, uh, you know, many of you will graduate from MIT and you will form organizations, you will grow organizations, you, you will play an important role in society. And um, I challenge you to think of any business as an education business because you are educating your teams, you're educating yourself, you're educating your consumers, you're educating your stakeholders, you're educating your users, you're being educated by them. Any business is an education business. So what is education? And this is important because, you know, today we live in an era, if, if you follow the field of education, of um, uh, competency education, we believe as a society that we need to make people competent. I actually believe in the opposite. And to me, education is a combination of mastery and community. This is what education is about, in my view. Mastery, mastery makes you relevant to society. And community, because community fosters and sustains identity, it makes you relevant to yourself, right? And this is, these are the two pillars of um, fulfilling existence in society, relevant to society and relevant to oneself. And, and so as I conclude this, you know, this is, this is my view of education. And I want you to be asking as you, as you, you know, uh, graduate from MIT, keep asking, like, what is your um, area of mastery? How do you grow it? Um, and how do you create a community to create this cycle between mastery and community? You know, and, you know, that's why innovation communities are so important to, uh, to all of us, particularly through the lens of this course. And, I want to leave you with, uh, you know, my, my definition of, of, of mastery. And this is really, you know, cutting edge for me. This is, I'm beginning to think about this question. This is where I want to uh, partly take my own uh, intellectual development. And so if it's, if it's incomplete, forgive me because it isn't complete and maybe you can guide me further. But I look at uh, mastery through the lens of my practice of uh, a martial art uh, known as Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. This is a martial art that I'm very fond of. Uh, it's, it's not a, because it's a grappling martial art, it's not exactly amenable to social distancing. So I'm suffering a little bit now. But you know, I observe masters in Jiu Jitsu and I ask, well, well what makes them masters? And as I asked said, ask yourself, well, do you know any master in the world? And what makes them a master? Do you know any master? And what's, what's behind it? And I view mastery through the lens of jiu-jitsu, and that is mastery is a, is a refined understanding of the building blocks of a craft, and then the ability to combine those fundamentals into novel combinations. This is mastery to me. And and so I encourage you to think about this question because this is what society needs from you. Society doesn't need competence from you. Competence can be provided by everyone. Society needs mastery from you. So what is mastery for you? How do you nurture it? And these are my thoughts for you. Thank you so much. That is fantastic. Thank you. I mean, really, really, you're such an interesting guy. And I think we're all lucky... Uh, to Thanks, work Eric. with you. It's really, really good. Um, Thank you, Eric. Yeah, I'm pleasure. Honored. I'm grateful. Oh, delighted. And so now I think we are going to go on to Maria. Maria? So I should introduce Maria more thoroughly. I met Maria, uh, you know, one of the wonderful things about uh, the universe at large and uh, academia in particular is, is that you meet wonderful people and then you start to work with them. And so I met Maria, has it been 10 years ago now? Yeah, I guess even longer. <laughs> <laughs> really? I'm afraid so. <laughs> <laughs> well, she was a young manager at uh, Fujitsu and also uh, Bosch, I think. And uh, uh, I thought her, she was very promising and tried to persuade her, I think, to go get a PhD. Isn't that right? That's right, Eric. And so she did. And then I became very responsible, right? Oh, my God, she did. So uh, she did that very well. And then uh, she came to uh, CC, CUNY and in New York. And so all of a sudden we were back in contact because she did her PhD in, uh, in, in uh, Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I thought, whoa, and she has interests that are, are really exciting to our community, our open and user innovation community, and the kind of thing we talk about in this course. We didn't have time this time to, uh, and I, next time, to make this a uh, full half session. So, but I really wanted everybody to know uh, 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 about what your work is and why you think it's exciting and what's going on, okay? Thank you. So, uh, please go ahead. So I share my slides now, is that all right? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. All right. There you go. Does it work? Yep. Oh, perfect, okay then. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to talk a little bit about my work. I really appreciate it and wonderful class. I really enjoyed very much attending. Oh, thank you. So what I would like to talk about a little bit is how the world is changing to support the free and consumer innovation paradigm, and in particular from a makerspace perspective. And I also want to talk about how this guy is about to save the world at least a little bit. But first of all, what are makerspaces? So what you can see on this picture is a photo I've taken at laser night at the New York Resistor Makerspace. And you can see people sitting together. And so what these self evolved grassroots makerspaces are is they are basically open access communities for individuals to meet, socialize, exchange ideas, tinker and experiment. And they typically work on all kinds of projects related to science, art or technology. And so you basically have this, on the one hand side, this community aspect of things where people help each other, uh, give each other more support, social companionship, but they also learn from each other. And on the other hand, you have the physical environment of a makerspace where people have access all of a sudden to tools and infrastructure that they would normally find very difficult to afford, such as laser cutters or CNC routers or 3D printers. So why should we care about makerspaces? And we have all heard about now in depth from Eric that free innovation is socially and economically very important and valuable but because it's under diffused, because free innovators are already incentivized and self-rewarded by using the innovation that they've developed, it's basically a market failure from an economic point of view. And so we need infrastructures that are supporting consumer innovation or free innovation and its diffusion. And so in the research community, the, the question came up whether makerspaces could be a potential solution to address this problem. And the question that the community had was basically, are makerspaces actually really offering value? And so I conducted a study in 2018 to investigate exactly this question and the role of makerspaces in supporting consumer innovation and diffusion. And I will not bore you with the details of that study, but just uh, in a nutshell, when I compared the rates with innovation or uh, related to innovation, collaboration and diffusion, the rates that I see in makerspaces are substantially higher than what you see in the household sector, like when individuals innovate at home at their discretionary time. So what you can see is that 53% of the individuals who are in makerspaces are actually developing something that is significantly novel and useful. So if we talk about functional novelty here more than 50% are collaborating, which is significantly higher than what you find in the household sector when people, uh, where a lot of people innovate alone. And interestingly, you find that 18% of the innovators are actually diffusing their innovation commercially. So I'm not talking about peer-to-peer -peer diffusion, I'm talking uh, specifically about commercial diffusion through startup activity. And especially those people who are collaborating are starting up a venture. So what are the implications of this study? It shows that makerspaces can indeed reduce costs 
of the factors that are known to support innovation and diffusion. So they provide access to collaborators, they provide access to tools and infrastructure, and this somehow induces individuals to innovate more. So they get ideas from there, they share information and they have access to tools and other opportunities and start diffusing these innovations through startups. So because maker spaces are beneficial and offer value to consumer innovation, they also appear worthwhile enhancement and governmental support. So what, what does this all mean now in this time of digitalization? And this is a question I dis, um, investigated with a collaborator of mine. And we shift now our attention basically from physical maker spaces to digital spaces. And in particular, we looked at the biggest 3D printing platform that, it, that is out there, Thiniverse. We downloaded 1.5 million designs and looked at what are people doing in this community. You see here just one example, it's a robot arm. You can see that over 2000 people like this uh, invent, this design, people collected it, people remixed it. So there's a lot of exchange of information and, and ideas. So why are digital platforms important? Why should we care about this? Again, the question is, what can we do to support the free innovation paradigm? We know innovating is difficult, diffusion even more so. And we also know that digital platforms, as we know them, allow information exchange and community building. And so the question now is, can they also support uh, innovation development and diffusion in the household sector? And are they also supportive like the physical maker spaces? And again, what we find in a nutshell, that platform activity, that means when you as an individual are active in this digital space, on this platform, when you are exchanging ideas, commenting on each other's work, you have higher chances to be successful on the platform. That means you are more likely to develop an innovation that is valuable to others. And this diffusion success depends a lot on how much time you spend beforehand. So how much you are commenting or remixing other people's work and also the type of activity. And the implications of the study are basically that, again, similar to physical maker spaces, also digital platforms can enable and support the creation of innovation. And that's very interesting in terms of when you are an innovator who is trying to innovate something for the very first time, and for those people who do not have access to physical maker spaces. And another interesting implication of the study was to see that free innovators are not just rewarded by developing this innovation and using it, but they are very motivated by sharing it because they are motivated and rewarded by social signals. That is, when somebody else likes their idea, when somebody else uh, uses their innovation design and remixes it. It's basically an honor that somebody else finds your innovation design as valuable for, for usage. So what we can see here also is that digital spaces or digital platforms also support free innovation and its diffusion. So how is this now all relevant? This is particularly relevant because hackers and makers gain momentum in the course of this crisis. And this maker is playing a core role in this. This is Guy Cavalcanti, and he's the founder of Make Megabots. But interestingly, he is also the founder of a Facebook group, an open source uh, group that uh, is uh, developing medical supplies, COVID-19 medical supplies. And this Facebook group is crowdsourcing solutions um, because we can all see that there, there are diminishing uh, supplies of uh, medical equipment around the world. And his idea is basically to grow the community faster than the virus mm -hmm. and to reach everybody in the world. And he is incredibly successful with this community building. Within about two weeks, the first two weeks, he had already more than 50,000 people in this Facebook group. People share designs, mock-ups, uh, they give each other encouragement, moral support. And uh, the interesting aspect is people are joining from all over the world. And although they all have different cultural backgrounds, 
the diversity is it that brings in all these different perspectives that you need to complement each other for innovation and creativity. But what glues this community so well together is this common shared goal to help each, uh, to help one another and to provide medical supplies for the world. And uh, this is a picture of the open source COVID-19 medical supplies group that, he's, uh, that he founded. And this is just one of the comments that I found and you can see they are very topical. So while we all are still figuring out how to get a mask, how to sew a mask, they are already talking about the next generation of masks. We are facing summer soon, so we need a different type of masks because they are getting too warm and getting whatever. We need a different type for the summer. And interesting is also how the founder runs this community from an organizational point of view. So he created a subgroup of 130 people and they are building a catalog of all the open source solutions that are uh, for medical supplies. Moderators then come in and flag the content that is posted in the main group. Uh, and after that, a group of professionals basically comes in and evaluates the flagged content. And this is now very interesting when we think about the free innovation paradigm and the manufactured or professional innovation paradigm, how they collaborate in this type of setting. So the professionals evaluate the content, a documentation group comes then in, puts the approved content uh, together in a read-only document so that nobody can change the approved content anymore, and creates a virtual library. And this library um, contains blueprints and instructions and so forth about gloves, respirators, face masks, and so forth. And this enabled a lot of people to start projects. For example, uh, one person found the WHO approved recipe for sanitizers and started collaborating with a whiskey distillery uh, somewhere where they got the alcohol to create the sanitizers that are up to the standard. Another person found an open lung project run from an Irish community. Um, where they created an open source ventilator project and so forth. So this is just one of these digital spaces that create a lot of benefit right now. But there are also other initiatives. This is, for example, a medical hackathon example. Um, how fast can we design and deploy an open source ventilator? Maria, I, give me one more minute, Maria. One more minute or so. Yes, yes, sure. And what is so interesting about these initiatives is that the media is picking up on this. So the media is increasingly acknowledging what makers are doing. These are just two articles that I, that I found about this phenomenon. There are many out there. And um, many might ask, what about the FDA? What is the FDA saying about all of this? And while I'm not an expert, I found the following quote very interesting. The FDA continues to take creative and flexible approaches to all of this. And so I found it incredible and amazing how a group of hobbyists and makers and hackers is now gaining a lot of momentum in this crisis. So yeah. thank you very much. That's wonderful. Congratulations. I mean, this is so interesting. And, and so I just want to point out one of the things I find so exciting about your work, Maria, is that what this is, is people inventing the structure they need to function. Correct. So this is what all of you who are engaged with the free innovation paradigm will encounter. If you think back, it was Edison, I think, who was one of the first people to say, you know what, we need an R&D lab and I will hire employees. And that became sort of a model that's part of the Schumpeterian firm. Now what Maria is doing here is she is tracking the fact that people say, hey, for us to collaborate, we need makerspaces. There was no firm that set up makerspaces, although Prasad is now doing it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, it's people evolving the infrastructure. And so all of you who are students here will find yourselves in the early equivalent 
of when Edison was trying to work on how to make innovative firms. You're in on the early stages, the ground floor of how to sort of have the free innovation paradigm and collaborative innovation function. So um, yeah, thank you, Maria. And I'm, I'm so glad you took me up on the idea that you should get a PhD. <laughs> I'm grateful too, thank you, Eric. Yes, we're all much better off for it. Thank you. So Mary, now it's your turn. You've got to, you've got to turn on your sound though. You've got to unmute yourself, Mary. There we go. Maria. Thank you, Maria. All right, Mary, so here you go. I should introduce Mary. Uh, Mary was somebody, uh, she was uh, is a, a division scientist at 3M, which is a very high position. And um, this was years ago. So I, I guess, Mary, I know you more earlier than I know everybody else here. It's been 20 years or so, right? Something like that. And so in those days, I was trying to push the idea of lead users and so on, the stuff that we're all talking about now and saying, yeah, sure. In those days, it was like, are you crazy? No, no. Uh, if there's anything good, we'll invent it. And uh, so I was looking around for a company that could possibly have some interest. And so I talked to a guy at IBM and a guy at IBM said, well, we're not interested certainly because IBM invents everything. But I saw this woman, Mary Sonic, who gave a presentation and she's a process expert. Maybe you can interest her. So I went trotting over to Mary and uh, lucky for me, she decided that yes, uh, she was interested in this. And so we have been working together ever since and she built a, a big enterprise doing this in 3M, lots of sort of reports and support to others and tools and so on. So in our free innovation paradigm and commercial innovation paradigm arrow setup, what really Mary's contribution is, is how firms can pick up by their own energy, pick up innovations from lead users and use them for internal product development. So Mary, now I think I have your slides, don't I? Yes. So let me find them. It says Sonic 3M, what more could we want? Uh, wait a minute now, whoa. All right, so this one end. Okay, close that. Okay, now, sorry to be slow here. Share slides, and where is Mary's? Mary, Mary, Mary. Damn. Mary, aren't um, you Eric, I'm happy to share her slides if she would like. Okay. Yeah. We fiddled with them a bit, so I should try to find them. Um, uh, hell. Oh, okay. So, yeah. um, okay. So now, can I share? Um, with any luck, this is it. No, shit. All right, yeah, would you please, uh, would you please do them, Jane? Would you please put up Mary's slides? Yeah, thanks. Ah, Jane is so much better at this. Thank you, Jane. Okay, thank you. Right. So as I say, Mary's a division scientist, or was a division, she's retired now. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, this one, first of all, um, Today I'm going to discuss the role of being a change agent at 3M and the path we took from, first of all, reading Eric's paper to developing a process. And through much trial and error, working with what you previously discussed, the political, cultural, and technical aspects of change. And I'm going to be describing some examples from 3M and one from a specific division, medical products, where we ended up with $70 million of new products the second year after our lead user study. So on this slide, um, it talks about how uh, innovations from the inside was certainly 
predominant and rewarded across 3M. And because of the strong culture, as you see here, after I started working with Eric and user innovation, I knew this process had to be strategically planned and funded, heavily funded because of extremely entrenched resistance to outside innovation. Next slide. So what we're talking about is um, the efficient, um, being an, becoming an efficient change agent. And uh, I was an insider. I'm a chemist and I was a product development manager in a large division. And previously I had really enjoyed figuring out how to develop and introduce a new process that helped my laboratory transfer information from the laboratory to manufacturing much more effectively and efficiently by working with 3M's uh, statistical design group. And for this process, I had to be sure, and that's um, the underlined words, I had to be sure that 3M's corporate level vice presidents, not just my division, we have divisions and then uh, corporate um, level um, people, that they knew about the successes in order to obtain funding so that we could implement across uh, many divisions this laboratory uh, data um, package process. So for example, I made sure that the corporate level management heard about the success of this process when our plant manager in France reported their successes in scaling up a new product of ours and I made sure that the corporate level manufacturing vice president and the corporate R&D both knew about it. And a few days after the success was reported by this French plant manager, I asked for and received more funding so that I could uh, deal with the resistance to change across 3M with that um, process change. Mary, can I interject here? Sure. Um, so what I wanted to do and why Mary and also Prasad are going to be so helpful for us here, when we discussed resistance to innovation, I made sort of uh, heavy information about how difficult it is to achieve change. But what I wanted to give you and what Mary and Prasad can give you is the positive side of this, namely, what that means is you have to be a change agent. You have to figure out strategies for introducing something. It's not enough, as in the case of a, a wonderful student who talked about trying to switch people over to environmentally friendly applicators. Uh, and then people were resisting, right? It's not enough to have a good idea. It's not enough to have something even that would benefit the company. What you need is somebody who knows how to figure this stuff out. And Mary and Prasad both are the, the best at this that I know. It's, it, it's utterly amazing. Mary, can I tell that example? Maybe or you forgive me for this. Yeah, sure. When Mary was a young chemist, I mean, I, this just blows me away. Uh, Prasad also does things that blow me away. But, but that when Mary was a young chemist, she was probably the only woman in 80,000 men at uh, 3M. And so the CEO of the company broadcasts one of those things that you do to everybody. The company's doing fine. And if you ever have any of you, any of the 80,000 of you have any problems, be sure to come to me, right? So of course, nobody does, except Mary does. So Mary goes trotting into the president's office and says, listen, I want to honor my boss, who I'm now leaving and going on to a different group, for mentoring me as a woman. Whoa, what happens? The head of the company invites up her boss, invites him to lunch, tells him what a great guy he is and all the rest of this kind of a thing. Now, what was amazing about this, and it's characteristic of Mary, what's amazing about this is that she didn't do something for herself. She did something for her boss. But by the time she left that restaurant, the line to mentor Mary was around the block. Everybody drew the lesson that, wait a minute, this person 
is going to somehow, I'm not going to lose by working with Mary. You know, she'll give me the credit that I'm due and so on. So it just amazed. I never could have thought of something like that. You keep doing this stuff. So, so to be a really good change agent is a skill that not all of us have, but I want you to see that it's important, number one, and number two, that it's possible. So here was a project we did that was against the DNA of 3M because it was not inside innovation, it was outside, and Mary pulled it off. So, <laughs> um, Talking about milestones, the next slide. Um, along the, the, Eric already mentioned with it, um, how we start, first started getting involved with Eric's work, but I knew we needed corporate funding to offer to divisions to try an unproven process. The entire process was written down in one of Eric's papers, and it was four lines. And two of the lines were find a trend and find lead users. That's it. And so, um, I sent his paper ahead of time to the corporate um, R&D vi vice president and manufacturing. And then Eric visited 3M to meet with the corporate head to ask for funding so that we could start working on this. And Eric's got a story of when he met with the corporate, <laughs> uh, corporate manufacturing vice president. That's right. So, so Mary invites me in to see this man. Was it Les Crow? I think it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's very senior in 3M. And I'm thinking, wow, what a wise man that he really sees the value of this marvelous thing I'm doing. And so I'm sort of saying, you know, isn't it one, it's sort of talking about a detail of what I'm doing and all the rest of this. And he sort of looks at me and he says, I don't know what the hell you're doing. I'm funding you because Mary says so. <laughs> right? <laughs> Mary has been successful around here. That's all I need to know. She's the one who knows what you're doing. And so I was properly put in my place, but also again, realize the value of a change agent, right? Mm -hmm. So as, as a result, after uh, we met with corporate um, R&D and manufacturing, they both contributed hundreds of thousands of dollars to our project so that we could provide an incentive for divisions to try this process and so that we could develop a methodology. And, but however, we also needed my division management approval so I could leave my job for a year and still be paid as a full-time employee and everything with benefits. And 3M does not do uh, any sabbaticals like in academia. So again, based on my past, especially process performance, um, my division uh, uh, vice president agreed to do everything we asked for to try something and develop a new innovation process. So this was really important. Um, while at MIT, we started working with 3M teams as we were developing the process. Our first team effort was a flop because we fell into the trap of thinking only about the technology aspects and how good it was, just what Eric had mentioned earlier. However, the strong cultural aspect that we just talked about was that we did not screen for the team members and the, their resistance to ideas from the outside. They had been encouraged and rewarded for their own inventions and own patents, as you saw in the earlier slide. So then we had to regroup with a new understanding about what Eric and others have talked about in this class was that all three aspects are important. The technical, the political, and the cultural, all three. So on my previous process change, I had considered and addressed both the technical and the political, um, but the cultural hadn't been a problem to me because um, I was an insider. So I, at least I had done two of them, but the third one is what bit us on our first uh, division project. So then on to our next um, and first big success at 3M and what we learned. First of all, we knew we didn't want to be in this you know have the same cultural aspects bite us again so we consciously searched and recruited a product development manager from medical products who number one was open to new ideas from the outside really important and number two was highly connected to their um, her division management 
so we could get the best technical resources to work on it and then we could get the, the technical people that were also open to outside innovations. But then also what we had learned in previous um, uh, trying the process someplace else, a key learning that we did in this case was she had an ongoing political connection to her division management that helped them see the current business was only getting incremental product changes and that this new area would be a much bigger opportunity. So that was really, really important. And then we added a whole uh, section to our lead user methodology, incorporating this learning about making sure this connection to management happened all the way along, for, especially when we're going for a bigger opportunity. As a result, as I mentioned, the first two years after our lead user work, they had $70 million in new product sales and it eventually formed a new division. But the, the biggest learning for us was we modified our lead user process to include more initial and ongoing connections to management. So they could see the benefit of bigger innovations and that was key. And as we set up our staff um, in the, uh, to have a corporate lead user support center, as 3M saw the growing importance of lead user research, and because they value learning so much, they allowed me to also work with other companies and any other company that wasn't a direct competitor to 3M because they, want, they thought and valued learning so much that this would make the process more re robust. So they allowed me to work with Nestle, Philips Electronics, and other companies, and we learned a lot. But again, in this case, Going back to the previous slide of a change agent, I made sure that our corporate leaders heard from these other companies about how much 3M was helping them. And then as we set up this uh, corporate center, our strategy was to obtain continuous corporate funding so we could recruit more divisions to try it, to always give them seed money so they could try something that we were just developing. And what we did was I set up an ongoing meeting with the corporate heads of R&D, manufacturing and marketing for division team leaders to present their results. Now, the reason I'm underlying division team leaders is this was unusual at 3M. We had 80,000 employees and it was rare for division team leaders to report results to a corporate vice president. Usually they only uh, reported to their division management. Also, I held the meeting in the 3M boardroom where none of us had ever been before. I asked the team leaders to report what they learned from user innovations, their implementation, and new products from this, if, that they'd um, gotten from this process. And also, I also asked them to compare the process with traditional product development. The strategy benefited the process by number one, the word got around 3M that the division team leaders were being recognized at the corporate level and therefore it made recruiting new team leaders easier. And number two, it immediately benefited us because I always sent my request for funds the next week and they always approved this request for again hundreds of thousands of dollars that we used as an incentive for more divisions. The next slide. <clears throat> as As we continually learned, it doesn't work to just say, here's something wonderful, go do it. So we discovered and built along the way, continually asking, what are the resistances, especially to big innovation? As you saw in medical products, we added a piece to our process to continually define the opportunity to management so they could be open to our user innovations and they could see the benefit. But we also found early on that there was a huge benefit to manufacturing engineers to be involved early in the innovation process. Now this was a shift because usually manufacturing had not been involved in the early, early product development um, phases. But after we um, tried this by putting them in as, you know, right from the start, we heard from manufacturing engineers that they were being rewarded and they had benefits for this early in involvement in innovation. So they benefited and we benefited by now having less resistance by manufacturing as they, and they played an active role when we would look at user innovations to three 
you know, and, and we'd have to adapt user innovations to the 3M processes. So um, it was helpful to have them in early on for this more acceptance along the way. So all along, we had to continuously figure out who is critical. And we really understood that both senior levels and junior levels are important. And then when we found out who was critical, we had to adapt strategies and adjusted to their um, incentives. So the change agent role was discover and build. And then Eric, you want to mention about the electrodes. Oh, this was just a, again, a, a learning, you know, I mean, people, you know, we went into these divisions and they said, oh yes, you know, we, another strategy of Mary's was to go into uh, divisions that were under the gun, that were failing, that were becoming uh, commodities, something like that. And uh, because they would have a lot with a big win. And so this one was uh, the electrode thing. Any of you have had these heart EKG things, you know about these little electrodes that you put on your skin. It's an adhesive and a couple of layers. Uh, and the division that made those things said, help, these are a commodity. What, 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 we, we have to come up with something new. And we said, well, what, how, how radical are you willing to be? And they said, oh, anything, the sky's the limit. So we went and we found out that actually nowadays with squids, which are these magnetic sensors that are very, very sensitive, you, you don't need electrodes anymore. You can start to, you can sense from like six inches above the, uh, the chest, just as you could in, in the tricorder in uh, Star Trek. So we presented this and they were horrified. <laughs> It's like, no, by radical innovation, what we meant was something we could run on the coding machines we now use. You know, you're getting rid of our disposable businesses. No, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we learned to really try to understand. But anyway, that was what I wanted to mention. But the, again, the bottom line for all of you, and Prasad will emphasize this as well, the bottom line for all of you is it's equally hard or harder to invent a way to get your innovation into successful practice in a big firm. These change agent stories, you know, Mary was at 3M, Prasad's at Ford. It's just as hard as inventing the thing in the first place. And you have to approach it just as carefully as you do approach the innovation process. It's essential in your kit of tools. So thank you, Mary. Was there anything else you wanted to say? Or yeah, just the last, the last slide real quick. Uh -huh. um, on the last slide, just the, the impacts. Um, as you heard, uh, many new products and a new division um, was formed out of just that one uh, lead user study. And also after four years, 40% of the 3M divisions were using the lead user method. As you see, the cost of 3M was pretty minimal relative to an offset by all the new products that we've noted. And a big part of it was the personal benefits to me. I, had, I really enjoyed figuring out strategies around all the different entrenched resistances, as I've mentioned, at all different levels, senior and junior level. And I ended up with a promotion and a 45% uh, increase in salary. So it was a big benefit there too. Yeah. So bottom line is it took a lot of trial and error Discovery, building, wasn't easy, but it was worth it. Yeah, congratulations, Mary. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, and Mary, I, I know you touched on it throughout your talk, but can you ask a question um, more specifically about how you managed to get continued support for the initiative after the first pilot in 1994 was a flop? Oh, well, that's where we... Um, we kept, we kept going back to the corporate level. And I think because 3M's culture is such that um, we do have failures. So they knew it was a failure. We talked about it. We talked about our learning. And because um, th that was, you know, they, they said, yes, that's part of the learning. And they agreed to that because they'd seen, I think, some of the uh, successes in the past. So that helped a lot to have my, that I was been involved with other successes in the past and to ask for more money even after the failure that we told them about. Yeah, Mary actually created successes in the past is mm -hmm. again what the story was. 
So yeah, congratulations, Ray. Thank you. So, Prasad, you're, you're muted, Prasad. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. And uh, let's see, where do I go to do that? I go there, go to view maybe your meeting and say start share. You're making me feel better, Prasad. <laughs> so what do I share now? Uh, let's see, desktop is it or application? Let me try desktop. Share my screen, yes indeed. Is my screen being shared or what's being shared? Nothing. Well, I'm feeling so much better. <laughs> okay, I get Mary, that. Mary, have you stopped sharing your screen? Oh, oh, yeah, Jane, you, you were doing it. Yeah, so, so Prasad, there should be like a green colored button that says share screen. If you hit that, um, usually it'll like pop up with a, a bunch yeah. of options. Oh, yeah. All the different things. Yeah. Yeah. So then you just hit the PowerPoint that you want, um, and that should get us. Uh, there, oh, there it is. Microsoft unknown. It says share. Yeah, share that stuff. Whatever it is. Got getting shared or? No, we may have to draw in you again, Jane. Maybe you have. Hmm. It's asking me. I how... feel better. Let me. <laughs> Thank you for saying. Okay, get it. This is uh... the of see, he's such a good change agent. He made me feel better. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, I am happy to do it. And maybe while we start this out, I think your dean actually has a question. I'm not sure if that's for Mary or Prasad, um, but our dean, if you want to buy us some time, that'd be oh, here it is. I think I think I can do it now. Let me see. Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah. You got it. Is that working? Yep. Okay, and if yeah, that is perfect. in fact mine, then I might have, uh, yeah, good. So I'll go ahead now. And how much time do I have? Five minutes, six we minutes? Have 15 minutes. Okay, I'll, I don't think I'll need all that, but uh, and I made a couple of uh, changes because I had the benefit of going last, and I uh, benefited ah. certainly from Mary's and and before that Mary's and and Erdine and, and yours, Eric. So mm -hmm. you might see some of that flow in. So um, well, first of all, thank you very much. This is a this is a great opportunity to speak to each one of you, and uh, believe it or not, going to Erdine's point, this has been really prime education for me. So every day is this great source of education. Thanks to you all. Certainly every Monday and Wednesday has been, has been tremendous. So I'm gonna share with you a story really centered around the change agent piece that Eric mentioned earlier, but it's uh, based on a story of a couple of individuals. And so um, I wanna sort of focus on the story of Zach Nelson just for a couple of minutes in part because he was a course two, he's an MIT alum, course two, 2012, and then spent a few years at Ford and now as a co-founder and uh, head of integrations, he says, of Pico ME something that I can't quite see myself. It's called uh, ME Pico? MES. Pico yeah. MES, yeah. So yeah. anyway, so the, the point here is that Zach, um, and I'll sort of touch on this a little later, um, came in um, really wanting to make things, build things, and, um, and I use the word, I take the liberty of using the word self-rewarded here in a broad sense because he was after all being paid by, by a large firm. And, uh, and so he had to get a certain day job done, which he was doing. Uh, what Ford has like other large companies is, uh, is a rotation process when you come in um, as a, especially as a new fresh college grad. And so he was finishing his day job and then had time uh, at his disposal. And so he was, making use of what he, of the tools that were available and was, was building things. And he came to me in part because I was looking, I was, I had a, I had a label outside my door that said innovation perhaps. And, and so someone sent him to me and he was uh, trying to um, build things, accessories for cars. He really, his, his ulterior motive was to be able to get a, uh, one of these performance cars and be able to ride them, not to own them. That was behind his immediate aspiration. He just wanted to be able to drive one of those and maybe rotate through one of those uh, performance vehicle groups. <clears throat> so um, he came in and, and during the course of his, uh, let's say, um, stay in, in uh, my group, um, started working on taking out a shift knob. That's this thing that sits um, next to the driver to go to change gears 
and he wanted to create some kind of a haptic feedback mechanism to that, which he um, did. He sort of got himself a 3D printer. Um, he had an old Xbox <clears throat> system that uh, when he unpacked his, uh, his uh, boxes from his uh, dorm at MIT, um, he found one that was uh, relatively um, unused. And so he unboxed that, took out some of the, the feedback, the haptic feedback, the actuator and that, and then assembled a haptic feedback system and got it all working, put it onto the car, got some feedback. And what it does is it gives you a little, as you drive your vehicle, it gives you some feedback to say, shift up or shift down, and then you can manually shift up or shift down. So he did that and he put it up on YouTube. And lo and behold, in a matter of a few, I forget it was days or weeks, he got 320,000 views. And it turned out that was happening just about the time when a new Mustang, the 50th anniversary Mustang um, was rolling out. And the Ford media folks were really quite surprised at the amount of um, views this, uh, this website was getting. It was a poor old haptic shift knob and it had no kittens in it and, um, or anything attractive uh, otherwise. And, and so yet it was um, you know, getting all these views. And it turned out uh, what made it really attractive was all the content was placed in the open source. Um, it was placed under the Creative Commons attribution. That allowed a lot of other people to sort of look at it and and look at how to make their own version of that. And so um, you could go look it up, but, but lo and behold, um, what that led to was um, a set of innovation designs that, that Ford got. Zach was within Ford, but yet working off in a community um, of, uh, of peers within Ford. And as, um, as Maria mentioned, um, there were these maker spaces that we were beginning to craft and, and he, through those maker sp spaces, found people that uh, could complement his design. And pretty soon um, design iterations took place. And, and before he um, left, this was maybe two or three years into his stay at Ford, um, one, the haptic shift knob had been, um, uh, had, had been used to inform the design of a, of a performance vehicle, the Shelby 350, which is a pretty expensive performance vehicle, um, but really uh, the, the indicator on that vehicle. So the actual device or the accessory um, or the interface in the vehicle looks quite different from that shift knob. But what the manufacturer, the producer, in this case Ford, got was um, the ability to start off with some basic design that had been tested and de-risked by the work that Zach had done, and then integrated and manufactured it at scale in a way in which, in a, in a form and, and function that looked somewhat, the function was similar, but the form looked quite different and it was integrated quite differently. So as Eric has said so many times, um, reminded us that you know, there's a role for the producer here in, in scaling things and making things production ready and making things ready for, for the general market. And that's exactly what happened here. So this is sort of Zach's story. Now, why is it that this is relevant to us? It's sort of relevant because there's a role that, that, um, that firms have clearly, but there's also a role that, that um, the individual entrepreneur innovator has, whether they are within the firm as in Zach's case, or um, outside the firm and try to interact with the firm or perhaps take their ideas um, to, to scale. And so as you go through your lives and either become part of a large firm or become an entrepreneur or essentially do something or observe work being done in the communities, there are a number of mechanisms, essentially ways by which we can provide innovation support uh, to be able to drive innovation designs back. And so this is really important. I think the generalized value here of what I'm trying to say is that there's a way by which this is a specific case, but you can generalize it to say that there's a number of ways by which innovation designs can come back um, to a producer and can further feed um, uh, the generation of more innovation um, designs uh, really through through some supports. And in this case, the specific support I'm referring to is um, is a platform called OpenXC, which was- Can I um, say a, something here? Yeah. Uh, so once again, just like Mary, Prasad is an amazing change agent. Uh, oh, and, and so none of this that he's describing as well, of course that could happen, could have happened unless he was. So he came from Silicon Valley to Ford. He was not, unlike Mary, he was not somebody who grew up in the company. And he was like, oh, those Silicon Valley folks, I'm, I'm not so sure, <laughs> right? 
And right. so he, uh, he was marvelous. And so he said, well, of course, you know, I wouldn't want to mess with the engines and I wouldn't want to mess with all that. I'll just take the software. <laughs> and so, right. <laughs> <laughs> as you know, these days, a car is software. But anyway, right. I'll just take this over. So yeah. uh, he had the power by interacting with people to set up things like maker spaces. He had the power to find and support Zach. And this, again, because he, he has an extraordinary way about him. I, I, I sort of try to learn from both Mary and from Prasad because it's not that they're claiming credit at all. It's just like people notice when Mary or Prasad have been in the room, things get better. And so they start after a while to think they're sort of magic, which in a way they are. So sorry, <laughs> I, I, I mean, just, because the point here is that we want you to know again that change agent skills, in part it's natural, but in part it has to be learned and it's essential to getting stuff done. So now you're gonna talk about OpenXC. Yeah, again, just briefly. You couldn't, have, you couldn't have done that unless you know, they knew you and trusted you and so on. Yeah, and I got, I've got to say that, um, Eric, this is, uh, you're not in the room here, but, but really it was Eric's inspiration and the fact that I just happened to have read, I think it was Democratizing Innovation, Sources of Innovation first came, actually I read it in the reverse order. I read Democratizing Innovation first and then came to Sources of Innovation. But I was then absolutely convinced that we had a role to play here by creating the right kind of innovation support. That then led me to be bold about ha making OpenXC happen. And you can go look up what OpenXC is. I think it's the specifics are less interesting to sort of from, a, from the standpoint of, of what I'm trying to say in the class here, but it's really the fact that providing an innovation support um, at the right time in the right context is very, very important. Um, and so that was really, uh, that was made possible. That helped Zach um, present these projects essentially for free and, and variations of that for free um, to the broader community. And that then enabled um, that sort of internal and external diffusion. So sort of, you know, this is a little busy here, but I want to sort of draw emphasis on a few things here. You really have to understand your customer, regardless of who that is and where you're operating. And in this case, the customer here was our internal customer within the firm. So someone who was going to be scaling things and taking it to a factory and making millions of whatever it was they were going to be doing. Um, and so our role was in being able to use these support systems as a way to de-risk their mission, the mission of the customer. Um, and they were really interested in being sure that we could present design solutions that they could quickly take to scale. And so what we did was provide a low cost, high speed design environment that allowed refinement um, and really in some sense, using other people's resources. Now, who are these other people? These other people were other employees, again, who had sort of created this free time, if you will, by getting their day job done without fail. And yet being able to meet in the evenings, being able to meet during lunchtime, and then when these maker spaces came along, as Maria said, being able to collaborate and being able to therefore diffuse their work more rapidly. And that then allowed this matchmaking to happen, which then allowed us to be able to use more in a valuable and precise tools, whether the tools were these open XC type of platforms or whether it was maker spaces or whether we, it was explicit peer peer sort of mentorship networks. And that then allowed the iteration to be more effective and then finally, um, and this is a point that Eric and I have spoken about and, and, and sort of commented on, it, it really had to do with this ability to convince a key sponsor um, that in their objectives, the organizational objectives, there had to be this line item that said that, you know, something along these lines, whether it was using OpenXC or innovating rapidly um, through the use of a maker space, um, was important and that we had to create ways and encourage uh, and foster those kinds of things in the, in the management structure. And so when that was done, when sort of getting this um, executive champion to incorporate that objective, um, then you had a lot of people sort of saying, okay, what do they do to be able to make sure that they can also 
um, sort of be informed by that objective and shape their planning uh, to incorporate the use of makerspace and the use of tools. And then that became um, really a valuable way by which the producer in this case was able to formally um, factor in some of the free innovation that was happening within the firm. Can I again insert, Prasad? <laughs> right, please. I mean, I, I was, this is totally amazing how he got it into the corporate strategy. Again, I mean, I just am in awe. So he, he tells me, look, you, you, I want you to come and visit and visit the vice president of engineering and these different manufacturing and the rest of it. And uh, it's gotta be on day X. So I said, oh hell, okay. So I went out to Detroit and he picked me up and we went around and we visited all these people, these very senior people. And I didn't know it at the time. And we explained what we were doing and what Prasad was trying to do. And I didn't know it at the time, but he knew that the very next day, senior management had to write down their objectives for the year. And of course they didn't know what the hell to think of. So it was like, mm -hmm. what the hell did Prasad say yesterday? Yeah, put that down. And so all of a sudden, it was like corporate policy. Now how the hell somebody is that imagined? It just amazes me. Anyway, that's, that's a change agent. Amazing. Good luck helps for sure. <laughs> I don't think so. That was, that was amazing. So um, I'll just touch on a few few points. I think this came up in the in the questions that uh, Jane had uh, collated for us. And so um, you know, one of the questions was, you know, what is COVID nineteen doing? So I won't get into the specifics. I just say, you know, it's affecting change everywhere we see, and and sort of one um, one generalized uh, observation is that service providers have begun to adapt uh, this in terms of you know, looking at what might be the best way to fulfill something, a uh, customer demand, um, yet uh, adhering to the needs to do uh, physical distancing. And so in the healthcare system, you're beginning to see, you know, Zoom or, or firms like Zoom um, and firms like Epic, which is a large uh, electronic health records uh, provider, collaborating to ensure that you can perhaps where appropriate visit the doctor through a video conference or a phone um, uh, call, um, as opposed to you know, going there in person. Food retailers are of course allowing online orders and curbside pickup and home delivery and drop off. And then within the automotive business that I know a little bit about, um, dealers are quickly beginning to offer services both for home pickup and drop off as well as curbside changes uh, where appropriate. And so you're beginning to see um, a lot of innovation happening here, things that I, I would say um, in many of these large uh, industry cases, the innovation had already happened, but the pipeline, and it was in the pipeline, but it was latent and now it's being tested at scale. And so through this large scale testing, you will no doubt see uh, many of these, you know, staying on post um, post pandemic uh, restrictions um, and, and being refined and being available and uh, demand also getting more tailored and, and specific to what they might need. And so you'll see a lot of this now being here for the long haul. And, uh, and so that's sort of one direct impact. Of course, there's very interesting things happening um, on the, um, uh, I'd say on the, in the household sector. Here is a little uh, snapshot that I took of, uh, of one of these little free library, uh, you know, sites that you have uh, on, on the curbs. Uh, along in the residential areas, this was just in our area walking along. Normally there's books kept in there and there's a little note that said, you know, instead of books, I'm going to have masks and so please help yourself take a mask for yourself. And so whether it's this or whether it's uh, homemade banana bread recipes, there's a lot happening um, in the household sector for sure. Uh, one thing that's happening, I think, broadly is there'll be a continued use of, of AI, whether it's for, uh, you know, surveillance, good or bad. Um, or otherwise, um, there's a lot of learning systems coming in place, trying to understand how behavior is changing, how demand is changing. And of course, that will then lead to uh, better ways to, to address that demand. So I think that's, we're gonna certainly see all, a lot of that happening. Uh, just a couple of um, uh, sort of concluding points here. Eric, I added these, took the liberty of adding this in based on what I was hearing. Um, so in the case of Zach Nelson, uh, whose story you heard, he was clearly self-rewarded. Uh, Dave Evans was a colleague of his, um, and, and both of them and several others who came together filled many a Schumpeterian hole, if you will. Um, and, and they freely diffused through using all the tools that were available. 
whether it was GitHub and the software licensing and hardware licensing frameworks, and of course the Creative Commons attribution. Um, they were busy within uh, the internal maker spaces that Ford had, but also the external ones. And as you can see from these examples, both Zach and Dave Evans uh, went off and did very well becoming entrepreneurs and, and founders, CEOs um, in their own rights. And so uh, this sort of goes back to the point that, that Maria had made earlier on. Um, and then I'd just say on, on being a change agent, I won't say a whole lot. You can go, uh, if you Google or Wiki, you'll see something. Uh, there's a little bit written up about what I do at Ford now. But fundamentally the point was this thing that I spoke about, OpenXC, that, that platform uh, enabled Ford to de-risk a lot of what we were trying to do internally on the product side. And then um, I happened to co-found a startup lab in, in Palo Alto in 2012. And the de-risking that had happened through what OpenXC was doing allowed us to really frame the possibility of a, of a small, relatively small space in Palo Alto to experiment quickly uh, and see what we needed there. And that then in a matter of a year scaled to become um, 100 plus, 150 plus operation. And now it's gotten even bigger than that. And so it's gone through three or four iterations. Uh, it's got three full iterations in the last four or five years. And so again, I think there's a number of ways where we change agents can play a role. Firms will figure out what to do for themselves, but I think it's really important to, to value uh, this whole framework of, uh, of having you know, free innovation and everything that it brings um, to us uh, to make change happen. So thank you. Oh, thank you. This is wonderful. And, 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 and what you can see here, those of you who are students and learning about this, is that there are a lot of us out there and we're doing real things. This is happening. This exists. And it's your generation as well as ours that is going to build it into sort of an understood kind of a process. At the moment, we're all winging it. You can join us in on that fun. But uh, uh, again, thank you, Prasad. I, I've got to say that uh, change agency is really, really important because uh, we can come up with wonderful things, but unless we have people who are like Prasad and Mary, you know, it's, it's going to be really tough. So thank you for that. Now, well, thank you all. Yeah, thank you. So thanks to all of us who have been speakers. And um, now, Jane, are there questions and so on? Any of you who would like to raise questions at this point? Erdin, is that what we want to do now? That would be great. And uh, if, if you'll allow, I can venture with the first question. Yeah. Yeah? Of course. Uh, and this question would be to both uh, Prasad and Maria. I was struck by the discussion of uh, change agency. And in particular, uh, you know, Mary, Mary said uh, something uh, very important in the beginning. She said she made sure that uh, her management at 3M knew about her successes. Um, I'm sure the question many of us in the audience were asking at the time is, well, how do you communicate about your track record without uh, seeming like you're bragging, right? There is, a, there is a fine balance. And so I wonder if both uh, uh, Mary and Prasad could reflect on that. But also in general, I think I wonder if you could offer to us some perhaps resources for people who are going to be entering uh, large enterprises and you know, how do you innovate within those without getting bogged down in organizational bureaucracy and politics? Yeah, Mary, you wanna go first? Well, what I learned was uh, to have the person like the French plant manager, I had I, I had him communicate directly to the corporate um, level vice presidents because, um, you know, right. he sent a copy to his own management, but then to the, that management also. So that's one vehicle. So if somebody says, gee, this process worked well, I would specifically ask them, well, would you mind sending um, right. a letter to both my vice president and these other people that I was trying to get uh, overcome some resistances? with them and so they could see some benefit. So I specifically asked people to write um, emails or you know let them know personally. So I wasn't doing it myself. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing I learned was um, a lot of times if, you, if you're trying to influence somebody, then um, I would say, okay, 
who is close to them that thinks more along the lines that I'm thinking about, like um, user innovation, then I would try to influence that person and then have their, who's more a colleague of theirs than I might be, because I might be lower down in the organization. So if I influence that person, then they could influence the person I was trying to change. Very good. That's, that's the second approach. And then the third approach is that um, I, like when we had these meetings with the corporate level to get more money, I had all the team leaders actually presenting themselves. I mean, I could have done it and most, and usually the people in the divisions would want that exposure themselves. And I thought, well, I'm gonna get more benefit for our process to get the exposure for the team leaders to do the actual talking. And also it's, they've got concrete examples that they're the ones that did the project. So I would have them do it, but I made sure that my management was there. So I was getting the credit but yet I was giving it to the team leaders so they could present it, but I made sure that my bases were covered too. This is amazing, amazing. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, absolutely, it's golden. Yeah, <laughs> I just said ditto. <laughs> yeah. what, how about you, Prasad? Yeah. You must have. Uh... Uh, yeah, no, I think I just say, you know, all of the above, I mean, Mary said it so well, yeah. And, and I just add a few things, one, and maybe it's, it's also the nature of what you do in, um, it, and so I think making sure that there's, um, in some sense, over communication as opposed to under communication is good. Um, and, and you want to be able to make sure the communication comes from the key stakeholder. And so whoever it is that the customer you're trying to um, work with and, and whose problem you're trying to solve. Um, and, and perhaps sometimes the stakeholder is a third person. You want to make sure that the two of them are um, are are aware of what it is that you're doing and how you're iterating. Most people really, you know, they, everyone, they're looking for a, for a silver bullet, but they can understand that it takes a while to get there. And so it, as long as you, 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 you are transparent and communicating with them and you're getting directional feedback in terms of how to iterate on the changes you're making, um, I think it works really well. Most people really are looking for something to help uh, themselves to, to help solve their problems. And so for me, the key thing was transparency and the fact that you're taking small steps in a relatively unknown direction, as opposed to a big step in a known direction. Because many people can take big steps in a known direction and I'm not needed to help with that. <laughs> They're very good at doing that. Uh, but it's really taking small steps in a relatively unknown direction um, that people are skeptical about. And so their being able to iterate rapidly, try things out, try new designs out, um, essentially get it done for free uh, helps a lot. And, so that, and, and uh, again, you're very aware of this as a strategy, right, Prasad? Yeah, no, absolutely. It really has to be a strategy. It can't just happen magically. Yeah, so, so you actually sit there just as Mary does and you think about, yeah. well, okay, who do I have to get on board here? Yeah, absolutely. And so on. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's it's... I mean, I'm really in awe of you too. So uh, I always learn a lot. So oh, thank you. And I think may may really summarize it well. You, know, you have to find these yeah, yeah, people yeah. in between. Unbelievable, unbelievable. I mean, each time, anyway. So I'm an amateur at it, but you guys are professionals. Yeah. I'm glad I know you. All right, so questions, other questions? Uh, Sophie has the question. Yeah, Sophie. Um, Please. Speaking of resistance, um, was there also the case that um, the users were resistant? Did you have to convince them to work together with Ford or 3M? Or were they just overwhelmed and proud that they can work together with such um, prestigious companies? Great, well, Mary. I was pretty shocked at that one. The, um, when we had the medical products lead user, uh, you know, the workshop that you saw in the video, well, here we were asking the doctor um, that invented artificial skin to come in for four days for problem solving with, you know, manufacturing, marketing, technical, everybody else. And we told him, oh, we are just going to pay your, um, you know, plane ticket and your hotel. Because that's, you know, we, that's all we could afford and we couldn't afford him anyway. And he said, oh, that's great. He just loved it. And then we had the head of surgery for the University of Minnesota, who makes, you know, 
all this money and we told them the same thing you know we're just going to have this problem solving workshop with these people and down the line everybody you know the all the different people that were invited um as lead users none of them asked for oh gee if if you take part of my ideas i need a patent for it or you know i need to be paid none of them because they just and they knew that we weren't going to lift something exactly out of their idea, but we were going to work with, you know, what we, what we do well at 3AM or what we can manufacture. And, you know, so we took their ideas and then changed it a lot. So, um, so I, I was, we were quite surprised that in all those cases, it was strictly self reward. Yeah, we were. And, and I must say also that the things that, 3M was going to manufacture were things that these surgeons and so on could use. Mm -hmm. So they were very eager to move practice ahead. They knew that this was a problem and they wanted to move it ahead. So it's also the case, Mary, you remember a couple of times we had people who said, well, all right, no, I want a patent and all the rest of that. And then all we said, because again, we don't want to get in the way of what they want to do. Mm -hmm. We said, in that case, we're going to find somebody else. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is knowledge and expertise. You, you you find the people whose interests are aligned with yours, and then yes. you're in good shape. Mm -hmm. Prasad, you think? No, I think so. You know, I, I you know, there's just a couple of points. This has come up a few times in some of the earlier classes, I think, and it had to do with um, you know intellectual property and oh my god, what happens, etc. So just in the case of Open XC, we made it very clear that you know we were going to give this away the fundamental ways by which things might be done um, are just ways to save time, to iterate, to get better design. And so it wasn't the haptic shift knob in this particular case, in that example, it wasn't that that system itself was going to be locked down. And there was a patent associated with it, but it was given away for essentially for free. And the idea was that you can use that to test, iterate, and, and create new designs. So I think the key point here is that firms have to figure out the best ways by which they can offer support and support to to de-risk whatever it is they might be trying to do. In our case, some of the tool makers um, certainly offered much more high precision tools than OpenXC did, but they were at a completely different price point, not accessible to the employees easily, um, and not really modifiable and hackable. And so it was a lot that, of course, while the employees benefited, but the tool, ma the tool makers also benefited and learned from it. They got informed in various ways. So I think everyone stood to gain here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank and you. Both, what, yeah. yeah, it's a great question, Sophie. Yeah. Thank you, Sophie. Anybody else? Okay, it looks like we did a great job here. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I want to thank everybody for participating. I want to thank, you know, my colleagues for participating. Uh, you've made it such a much better experience for all of us. And, uh, you know, I want to thank my co-teacher, Berdine. Uh, we, we, we work very well together. So, uh, yeah. And we want to thank Jane as well, by the way. For as you saw today, bailing us out as she repeatedly does. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so thank you. That's that's the end of this course, and and we wish you all well, and hope to see you back at MIT very soon. All right. So thanks to everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, speakers. Amazing. It's graduation. Yep. Amazing. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank bye bye. Thank you all. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Have a nice day. Yeah. You too.